Hey guys, it's Gary. I'm back. Um, I can avoid doing an epic this time, I promise. Um, I know probably a lot of you haven't even gotten to see my 82-minute um, discourse that I did just a few days ago. Um, I have several ideas for videos, but you know a lot of them involve um, spending time and listening to the albums before I talk about them. This time, it doesn't really. Um, I had hinted at something, something that I, I said in my in my last video, my long one, about um, it being difficult for me sometimes, uh, often actually, um, to listen to an artist's music after they passed away, assuming I got into them before they passed away. Um, somebody like a John Coltrane, who died in '68, I think, '67 or '68. Wes Montgomery, he, who died in '68. They had passed before I got into them, uh, so when I got into them, they had they were already deceased, so it, it, it wasn't difficult. Um, it was hard to get into their music, um, but um, it's incredible, you know. Just looking over my collection today, I realize a lot of the musicians that I have uh, jazz more jazz musicians than anything else, um, but a lot of those guys. Um, that I got into have passed some time ago, uh, but I got into them when they were still all around. And it's kind of depressing, so I have this new series I'm gonna do, because there's, you know, when I was going through my stuff, there were so many musicians that this um, is the case for that I could do a, an entire series of videos. Um, that's why I guess one of the other reasons I'm envious of younger people. They can get into this music and they don't have any of those associations of, ah, oh, I remember when this guy was alive. You, you know, and, and many of them have been very difficult, actually. This is something that um, I think might be uh, unusual for me that other people don't seem to suffer from as much, um, regardless of what genre of music it is, really. Um, uh, I generally almost always have a lot of difficulty listening to these recordings um, of these artists that I was into when they were still around after they pass. Um, I can remember when hearing in the car radio driving when Miles Davis had passed away and there's one famous early Miles Davis session recorded uh, actually blocks away from where I lived in Hackensack in 1954, I think it was 54, on Christmas Eve, uh, there was a famous Rudy Van Gelder session, actually was recorded in his parents' house, uh, of Miles Davis, Thelonious Monk, uh, Milt Jackson, I'm doing this from memory, Percy Heath, and who was the drummer? I forgot who the drummer was. Um... But anyway, um, when I got that particular album, which came out like in 1955, obviously I didn't get it then, um, but I did get it in the very late 70s, early 80s maybe. It's where every single one of the musicians um, at that session were still alive, every single one of them. Um, and it's weird to think of it now. It's not just one of them. Around. Every single one of them have passed away. Every single one. Percy Heath, the bassist, was the sole uh, holdout uh, of those sessions for years. I remember when Thelonious Monk died, when Miles died. Mill Jackson, I found that about only years later, despite the fact that it's weird that they didn't report these on the news, especially for the musicians that lived nearby. Um, Percy Heath, uh, Percy Heath, um, Mill Jackson, vibraphone player of the Modern Jazz Quartet, lived his last bunch of years uh, in the town next to where I lived, and I didn't know that um, initially until long after he passed. So you'd think it would have been mentioned on local news. Mill Jackson, Modern Jazz Quartet, they were going since the late 40s, early 50s. Um, wow. It's incredible that all these all these uh, American jazz musicians, even the local guys, they don't bother to report it on the news. Um, and these are not people with 
you know, two year long careers or one hit record kind of thing. Um, so this is the start. Oh man, I was just looking over my stuff. I have so many that fit this mold. Um, and most of them, it's even hard for me. I have listened to their music since their passing. Um, but oddly enough, I have to be in a really good mood to do it, or else it brings me down. I guess there's this thing that, um, when you listen to the music when they're still around, it's almost like their their spirit is in the air. You never know, these guys could be at home listening to the same album, you know, of their own, uh, at the same time you're listening to it. And there's something about when they're gone, and you put that record on, and it's like, well, I know he's not listening to this one now. Um... But since I already mentioned the Modern Jazz Quartet, I've got a lot more records here than I'm probably going to get to show uh, for the sake of keeping this at a reasonable length. And um, then doing this as an occasional, um, albeit dep depressing, uh, series. Um, start, since I, I mentioned the, the Modern Jazz Quartet, when did I get into them? 79, maybe? 1979? All of the members were still alive. Um, they started actually as uh, an outgrowth of uh, Dizzy Gillespie's big band. Um, Gillespie had a big band, and four of the guys in the band um, kind of started the quartet as a, as a side project for them. And that was John Lewis, the piano player, uh, Milt Jackson on vibraphone, uh, Kenny Clark, who was the original drummer of Modern Jazz Quartet, and Ray Brown, who is a really wonderful, well-known uh, bass player. One of the most recording musicians in the world I, I read once was Ray Brown because of the number of sessions he did. Um, they, When they started working on their own a, as part of this outgrowth of uh, Dizzy Gillespie's band, they actually were known, um, I believe, initially as the Milt Jackson Quartet. Um, Percy Heath the bass player um, replaced Ray Brown on bass uh, around 1952, and that's when they uh, kind of switched from using the name the Milt Jackson Quartet um, and started calling themselves the Modern Jazz Quartet with the arrival of Percy Heath on bass. Um, their early, early albums were made with um, Kenny Clark on drums, their very, very early albums. Um, but um, he only stayed about three years after they adopted um, the name the Modern Jazz Quartet. And around 1955, he had done a bunch of tours in Europe and kind of preferred the treatment of people, especially black jazz musicians or black musicians in Europe. Uh, and in fact, they got more work and the pay was better. And um, so I don't think it was a musical difference as much as Kenny Clark said, you know what, I'm going to France, and he stayed, in, he went in France, stayed in France, and actually played drums um, with a lot of visiting American musicians when the American musicians uh, went over to tour in France, um, Kenny played with them there as the drummer. He is uh, on that, um, I mentioned when I was doing my compact jazz uh, series, compilation series, the Miles Davis one, had some material from Elevator to the Gallows, the French title I can't pronounce, a movie soundtrack that uh, Davis did in France, and Kenny Clark played on that as well. The other musicians, bass player and uh, pianist, were French musicians, um, and musicians that Kenny Clark had played with a lot. Um, so I, I, I thought I had, I thought for some reason that um, Kenny Clark, the drummer, had moved back uh, to America, but apparently not. Um, apparently he stayed in France. Well, that was a long time. He went over in 55, uh, died in 1985. Um, again, that wasn't reported, and that was stuff that, I, I, you know what, I'm sure I didn't, f I probably didn't find out about Kenny Clark passing away anywhere near 1985. As a matter of fact, probably only after the whole internet Thing and everybody had PCs at home, uh, and I looked it up, did I find out that he passed, which would have been, you know, a lot of years later, um, you know, maybe 10 years or more later. But I have, um, ah, very unprofessional of me. 
um, some M- MJQ stuff. I have more than I thought I did. Probably more on um, CD, actually. Have an early one, Django. This was a fairly well received, well known album. Um, and this was recorded uh, apparently from a couple different sessions cobbled together. Because uh, on here it says recorded between 1953 and 1955, which means this is the original lineup with uh, Percy Heath on bass and Kenny Clark on drums. Most, because they went until the um, early 90s. Um, a lot of records, a lot of tours. There's not a lot of albums with Kenny Clark on them. Just really their very, very earliest stuff. And this was probably one of the uh, better known ones. Um, just the four of them, no additional musicians. Mill Jackson on vibes, John Lewis, piano, just an incredible piano player and, and composer, really. It was really John Lewis that chose the direction of the band. Mill Jackson was very much a blues player and standards player. And John Lewis was a standards player, but he was a composer, and he grew up uh, loving classical music and Bach and those kind of things. And it was his kind of concept, really, that made uh, the modern jazz quartet unique. They weren't really a bebop band. They were a a lot quieter, and, and John Lewis wrote a lot of music for them. And it wasn't, you know, that kind of... You know, re- regurgitated, reharmonized standards. His stuff was really quite adventurous, but, but very laid back and very quiet. Easily could go in the background. Um, not meant to be background music, but he had that counterpoint thing, that whole classical music background. And um, played standards wonderfully. Autumn in New York. Um, wrote a couple, like one, one bass hit is on here. Um, but they had a nice, long, wonderful career, and it's it's really a jazz band that I think a lot of people could appreciate that can't appreciate extended uh, soloing and blowing by by musicians. And of course, they didn't have a horn player either, um, so there was more uh, interplay to listen to. You know, you're really listening to the. Uh, interplay of the the vibraphone is you know the vibraphone's more the melody instrument than 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 uh, because they didn't have horns and um, you know the, the piano being very much up front. Um, they did albums with guests. Here's uh, a little bit later. I don't know the date of this one. Modern Jazz Quartet at the Music Inn, Volume Two with uh, Sonny Rollins on some tracks. Uh, Connie K is on drums. Connie K came in in 1955, I believe. Um, and became their drummer, and that um, lineup stayed intact until Connie Cape passed, actually. Um, so, you know, from 55 on until 80... No, 90-something. Um, that it was this these four musicians, John Lewis Piano, Milt Jackson, Vibraphone, Percy Heath Bass, Connie K on drums. Um, so they really had a long stay uh, going at it and you know a lot of the, they did some albums with guests not a ton but a handful but I mean just look at their look at their output you know um, here's another early one you know I should have they're not very good with putting the dates on the back of these things uh, this is Pyramid this is a fairly this I know is a fairly early album of theirs is, you know, the, the Connie K lineup, Percy Heath Mill Jackson, John Lewis. Uh, they do some standards here that everybody knows. It, it don't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing. Um, they do the song Django again, How High the Moon. Um, but the, a lot of the MJQ records uh, are a lot of John Lewis um, compositions. And, um, and, and some standards mixed in, and... Um, Milt Jack- some, some Milt Jackson compositions as well. Most of the Milt Jackson stuff is kind of in the blues vein, though. Um, fairly easy to, to, to follow. Um, I showed this on my compact jazz thing. This is only from two sessions. And 50, I think it was 56. So, but, um, you know, the Connie K lineup, Percy Heath lineup. Live in Spain, 1971. I want to say this one didn't come out at the time. I think this was an archive thing. Um, John Lewis again, Milt Jackson, Percy Heath, Connie Kay. 
Um, this one I have playing, I doubt that you can hear it in the background, kind of randomly selected it. Um, a couple standards on here, uh, Willow Weep for me, but there's one track on here called The Jasmine Tree, which is a John Lewis composition, which appeared, uh, I love, one of my favorite compositions of theirs, that I love, 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 um, that appeared on, on many uh, modern jazz quartet albums. I mean, they, they re-recorded their stuff, like a lot of people. Like a lot of like a lot of uh, jazz musicians that um, recorded originals, they they did various versions of them through the years. Here's one that didn't come out until uh, Connie K passed. Now, if I can move my mouse here because I can't remember dates that well. Um, do 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 do. Connie K. died November 1994. Um, after his passing, according to the Wikipedia biography, it says they didn't tour after that. But you know what? They did tour after that, I'm sure. I seem to recall a guy, Mickey Roker, I think his name was, playing drums on on some concerts they did. They did a limited number of concerts after Connie K.'s passing. I'm, I'm, I'm sure of it. And uh, it was only because Connie Kay had passed that he had been replaced. Um, but but uh, after Connie Kay's passing, they didn't go back to work immediately. And they did very limited amount of appearances. Um, and so uh, Connie Kay died November 90, 1994, which kind of, kind, of, kind of put the brakes on the band, even though, like I said, they did do some live performances after that um, with the drummer filling in. Um, but this particular album is interesting. It, unreleased at the time, after Connie K passed, John Lewis was apparently going through um, stuff in his attic at home and came across some very old reel-to-reel -reel tapes, if reel-to-reel -reel tapes, if you can imagine. And I don't know if he had a reel-to-reel -reel player at home still or whether he brought it somewhere because what he found on these is this concert, which is a two-disc set, recorded in Slovenia on May 27th, 1960. It had never been released. And when John Lewis listened to it, he said, oh, he hadn't listened, he hadn't heard it since he probably first got the tapes. Completely forgot he had the tapes. Said, oh my God, we were really fantastic that night. It's a really, you know, for 1960, very well-recorded concert. Um, apparently the full concert because it's two discs um, and John Lewis said wow we were playing really great then and couldn't believe that it hadn't been released and gave it to a record company uh, I think it was Atlantic too looks like this came out in Atlantic yeah Atlantic Records I didn't know Atlantic back in 95 was still bothering with jazz to be honest with this is when this came out John Lewis wrote um, the notes on here in February 1995 when I saw this, um, I don't think I was aware that Connie K died until I saw the album out. It's called Dedicated to Connie. And um, there's some nice liner notes from John Lewis in here explaining how he came across the tapes. And it's a nice recording, too. And it has um, things that they're known for, bags groove. It don't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing, which oddly enough, was I didn't think was a track that they played that much. But I got two versions of it. Django again on here. Um, Pyramid again on here. Um, but, uh, you know, it's they do Round Midnight. Uh, this is a really nice, uh, good live album. Um, I think just because I like the material of another live album that I'll show you uh, in terms of song selection better, I might recommend that over. That. Um, my first... I think this was my first MJQ record. I'm not sure. Um, no Sun in Venice. Um, this gets my vote for the quietest jazz album ever recorded. Ever. No if ands, or buts by an acoustic group. Um, I bought this on album, and I have the album, and I'll show it to you just because the cover's so great. It's a famous painting. Again, Connie Kay on drums, Percy Heath on bass. Uh, Milt Jackson, vibraphone, John Lewis piano. This is slightly, slightly different than your standard uh, MJQ release in that it was uh, 
a film score for a movie. And being a film score, uh, John Lewis actually wrote all of the material on here, the entire album. Uh, so there's no blues. Uh, when it comes to Milt Jackson's contribution, he was the blues player. He was a little bit more of the standards player maybe than John Lewis. But there's no... There might be moments where it's slightly bluesy on here, but there's no uh, Milt Jackson input in, in here in terms of compositions. Um, so it comes probably closer to a classical album than anything that they recorded otherwise. Um, even though that classical element was pretty much always in their music. Um, and, and I, I got to tell you, you know, if I was going to send somebody to pick up just a couple MJQ albums, this would be one of them. And I don't even highly recommend it on vinyl, which I have. I first bought it on vinyl because it's so quiet. I've never heard a quieter recording, I think probably of any kind of music, even classical music. Um, this is all low-key stuff. Really pretty. Can easily melt into the background, but if you're not so much into, into mainstream bebop kind of jazz, but you can accre appreciate jazz and acoustic music, uh, maybe you're not as much a fan of the blues. Um, this would be a good a good place to go because that stuff is not here. Um, here's the the original album that I bought. I remember buying this in disco. I remember this is one of those albums I remember picking up in the store. Uh, the cover got me uh, because at that time I didn't know a lot about MJQ. And by the time I picked this up, which would have been uh, 78 or 79, um, they had a large selection, obviously, of albums. So which one to pick? Uh, no Sun in Venice film score by John Lewis. Fantastic album. Fantastic album. So that would be, um, if I was going to suggest two albums, this is the other one. This is probably my favorite live album that I have by them. The last concert, the Modern Jazz Quartet. Not really the last concert. They retired kind of in 1974 for a number of years and came back in 81. Um, so they and that was planned that they were going to retire the comeback wasn't planned um so they gave this uh this concert and built it as this is our last concert together and it was you know connie Kay and, and percy heath and, and Mel jackson john lewis and this is really well it's fantastic it's well recorded this would be one of those two albums that i would suggest by them um you haven't opened this for 20 years On LP, I think this this runs about this is a two LP set it runs about ninety minutes. A little bit later, they came out with, uh, but it wasn't the whole concert. They came out with this, which uh, the more from the last concert, which I believe contained everything else. Another forty-two minutes, roughly, uh, single album. And it's not that this is the junky stuff. As a matter of fact, some of my favorite tracks from the concert were actually on here. Um, they do a, a track called The Jasmine Tree, which is a, a John Lewis composition, an original, that they recorded a lot. Um, and it was just one of my favorite favorite tunes. And they do, you know, Mill Jackson's blues tunes and stuff like that. The nice thing is when they release this, I have, I have to pick this up on CD. Uh, when they re release this on CD, because of the extended playing time available, they did a two CD set that had both albums on there. So over two hours, about two and a quarter hours, I guess, of material uh, from their last concert in 74. And because it was their, supposed to be their last concert, it's um, very well recorded. Um, and it's from the 70s, so it has better recording technology than their stuff from the 50s. Um, but all these guys, my point being, all these guys were alive when I was getting into them. And it's a little hard for me to listen to their stuff now if I'm not in a great mood. I should have this, didn't I? And the last one. Here's, here's one of those that I should have included in my very old video um, of albums that I missed on CD and are now out of print and cost a small fortune that I really want. Modern Jazz Quartet. This is one of their albums with a guest, uh, Lorindo Almedia. Almedia the uh, nylon string um, classical guitarist. Uh, who I am into as well. Um, this is a nice album. It's a little dryly recorded. Um, what year is it from? You know, these things these things aren't incredibly great with it. This is an oldie. 
Yeah, this is quite old. I don't I don't see a recording date on here, but it is not. Um, it's not one of their later period ones. It's one of their uh, early earlier ish albums. I want to say late fifties, early sixties. One note samba by Joe Beam. They do uh, concerto de Aaron Wes. They do. Uh, why I didn't buy this on CD when I could have gotten it, I don't know. Um, it's just a John Lewis tracks, naturally. And uh, Fugue in A Minor by Bach, they do. Nice combination of uh, MJQ with a nylon string guitar. Which brings me to my second guy, since it's, it's, it's kind of attached, but having trouble digging out his records. Uh, the very same guitarist, the Lorindo Almedia Trio. Um, Lorindo Almedia um, settled into, into the U.S. He passed away, uh, again, another guy that I was into while he was still alive. He passed away in 1995. He was born in Brazil. He died in 95 at age 77. Um, came to the U.S. Um, I think he went right when he came to the U.S. in 1947. I think he went right into uh, Los Angeles uh, to work in, in film studio orchestras. So I guess he knew how to read music. Heavily inspired, strictly um, a nylon string classical player. Heavily inspired by classical music. Uh, but he was a jazz player, you know, too, as well, and he improvised and came out with um, a lot of albums. The albums I didn't even pull out that he's on um, are the LA4, um, another band where, where um, most of the members now have passed away. Uh, Shelly Mann on drums, Bud Shank um, on, uh, on horns, and um, Lorindal Media was the guitarist, and... Um, Ray Brown was the bassist. Was it Ray Brown? You're pretty sure. Yeah, Ray Brown was the bassist in LA4. Um, all of them have passed now, sadly. But it was a band made up of musicians from the Los Angeles area, jazz musicians. I have every LA4 album that was recorded in the, that was released in the US. They had um, a deal with a Japanese record company while the LA4 was still around. And they only started late in their career. They, I think they started in the 70s, uh, early 70s, and went until basically the members passed away. Um, but uh, they were based in jazz musicians based out of Los Angeles. A lot of, of them had worked in the, in the film scene, uh, film soundtrack scene, which is where a lot of jazz musicians went to uh, when the jazz work dried up. Hold on a second. I've got to turn the music down a little bit. Um, and um, he was fairly unique. Uh, Charlie Bird is really the only guy, the only other guy that um, was a uh, nylon string player in a in a jazz concept type of playing with improvisation and stuff. Uh, I'm not sure exactly where I learned about Lorindale Media. This, because uh, I, I learned about the LA4 a little bit later. And LA4, I was going to say, too, had a, an exclusive uh, agreement with a Japanese record company at one point. And so they were recording albums that got released here in the U.S. and albums that got released only, only in Japan. And it was a bit sad because they're, they're very hard, very hard and expensive to come by. They're Japanese albums. But I do have... I, I believe all of their U.S. albums, which are eight or nine albums, and I was going to do a whole feature on on the L.A. Four anyway um, at some point. And again, I, I could have included them here because it's another group where all the members were active and alive when I got into them, and now they're all past. Um, this album's from April 1983. We're down media. I love the um, setting. Again, only nylon string guitar. Uh, Bob Magnuson on bass and Milt Holland on percussion. So it's a trio of bass and drums. Believe it or not, he plays uh, a version of Vangelis's Chariots of Fire on here. Um, always does some kind of jazzy reworkings of classical music. 
and jazz stuff. Uh, Artistry and Rhythm by Stan Kenton, he does on here. Um, Richard Rogers, Slaughter on 10th Avenue. Oh, uh, the kind of pop ballad, Up Where We Belong, he does on here. Um, he does one or two, uh, Liza, a George Gershwin track. Um, one, I just see one track that he wrote on here. Uh, two. He did two, two originals on here. Always worth listening to, though. Um, this particular album, this is my favorite album I have of his. Uh, Learned Owl Media Chamber Jazz, another one, another one that I missed on CD. I gotta get this on CD, but it's another one that was on CD out of print on Concord Records, and I went on a bit of a rant at one point about Concord Records because Concord Records is still very much around, but they're focusing entirely on pop music now. And um, all these great albums by guys like Barney Kessel, uh, Charlie Bird, um, Lorena Hamidia that were on Concord. Concord was really a, a home for a lot of American jazz dudes. Um, in the in the 70s or so and Concord is around in Maine but they're really so focused on pop music now and they're not even keeping their old stuff in print and this is one that they've allowed to go out of print before I could get my hands on it unfortunately um, Lorindau Media again on, on the nylon string guitar Bob Magnuson on bass Jeff Hamilton on drums uh, Jeff Hamilton uh, did play drums and he's the only guy left alive uh, that pl he played drums for a while for the LA Four. Uh, Shelly Mann was the original drummer. He dropped out due to due to work, and I guess he was managing his his nightclub. And uh, Jeff Hamilton, which is a much younger generation, came in to the LA Four, and he's the only guy um, out of the five guys that were in the LA Four at various points uh, that is still alive today. Um, so he had a history of this uh, playing with Lorindo immediate already. This album came out in 70, 79. I bought this as a new release, I remember. I like I like the cover, too. And again, I didn't know anything about him. I just saw that, that he was a nylon string guitarist in a trio with bass and drums. Um, interesting um, concept, because it's not a classical album, you know? So it, it's there's improvisation and jazz and things like that. And I'm like, wow, i got to check this out. Um, so I was obviously into jazz at this point already, but I remember getting this as a new release. So I've had this since um, seven, well, date on here seventy nine, and um, I don't know exactly when it was recorded. September seventy eight, it is on there. Uh, September seventy eight, it was recorded. It came out in seventy nine. That's when I picked my copy up at Disco Man again. I can remember going through the racks and, and seeing this new. Um, list price eight ninety eight back then. Which seemed like a lot to me, though the actual price I paid was six twenty, six twenty nine. Which, oddly enough, believe it or not, still seemed like a lot of money back then. Records last those last few years from the late seventies on, record prices started creeping up very, very rapidly. They were going up like like a dollar a year for the last several years, really, until the CD era came around. Um, this is a, this is a really good album. This is my favorite album of his. Um, Maybe even over the LA4 only because LA4 has Bud Shank on, on flute and saxophone. So uh, Bud Shank gets a lot of the solo time and he's the lead voice in the group. Here there's no horns or anything, it's just a trio. So you really get to hear uh, Lorinda Amelia play. And there are tracks, individual tracks from this album on YouTube I checked out. So you can actually, um, you know, sample it. Um, there are tracks by Bach on here. A couple tracks by Bach, so he's he never lost track with his classical roots, and he does Debussy's Claire de Lune on here as well, um, and a Chopin piece, and no originals, oddly enough. But this is a really good album, really good album. I wish Concord Records would just do something. If they don't think they're going to sell well, package a you know two discs set together and stick like three albums on there because all these little forty-minute things. Um, you could fit, you know, three albums onto two CDs and do it at a decent price and, you know, maybe get some sales out of it. I don't know. Um, I have a ton, a ton more stuff. I didn't even show my Milt Jackson albums when I was doing the Modern Jazz Quartet. Solo albums I had by Milt Jackson. Um, and I have to point out one, one thing. This one I bought, I remember buying this in, in a uh, 
in a clearance section of one of those really ugly, um, what do they call it, like closeout stores, you know, where they sell a lot of stuff discontinued cheap, and they had a whole, um, just a little, a little uh, bunch of CDs, you know, new and sealed, but cutouts, you can see the cutout notch there. And uh, I was flipping through, and everything is mixed, you know, dance music and rock music and jazz. Is, they just threw them there, down together. And um, I saw this Mel Jackson one, and I'm like, oh, there's one I don't know. And I'm glad I picked it up now because it is out of print, and I'm looking at copies of it that were really expensive now. The thing that made me pick this one up, and it's weird, I had a feeling about this. This is one of his later recordings from the early 90s. It came out in 93. There's a track on here called Cedar Lane. Now, Cedar Lane, in the town next to where I lived, was the main street in town, the big main street in town, and uh, in, in the town of Teaneck, New Jersey. And that's where all the, all the shops are. There was a, a you know, movie theater there, an old-fashioned movie theater had been there for decades. You know, little individual stores there. There used to be a, a record store there, too, and I'm sure that's gone. I used to go, and I bought a lot of my albums there. Um, you know, privately owned record store, you know, drug stores, um, uh, restaurants, um, magazine stores. Um, the first place I ever saw... I ever saw chocolate-covered potato chips or chocolate-covered pretzels. It was about 1981 in this in this store that made them there, fresh. Um, had never seen or heard of it prior to that. Um, and um, that's Cedar Lane. And, and despite the fact that I'm sure every state has a Cedar Lane in it, I had a feeling. And I had to buy this album. And I bought this album. And I, I, I had a feeling that Milt Jackson was making a, a reference, even though he didn't grow up in Jersey, he didn't come from Jersey. I had a feeling he was making a re reference to the Cedar Lane by me, and sure enough, he was. Um, after I got home, now, this album came out in 93, and I picked it up sometime after, um, probably just a couple years after it came out, so the internet was already around. I took a look and found out, well, I found out two things. By the time I looked it up, um, I think Milt was Bill Jackson? Still? I'm not sure. I'm not sure if he was still alive at that point, to be honest with you. Um, but um, I did. I did find out that indeed, Bill Jackson lived in Teaneck. So um, he was from the Midwest, I believe, initially. But um, he had moved and had lived in Teaneck the last years of his life, um, quite a bit. Uh, he, he had been there for for some time. And um, so he died in October of 99. So I want to say I had the, um, I'm not sure if I had the CD by that point or not, to be honest with you. But um, no, I must have. I must have because uh, if he was still, so I, I must have bought it after October 99 when he passed away. Because had I known while he was still alive um, that he lived in Cedar Lane and I was around the corner from there, it was a couple miles away, I would have started hanging around Cedar Lane with the CD, just waiting to see him so I could get him to sign it, as ridiculous as that sounds. So I did, actually, that's when I found out that he had passed away, I guess, is after I got the CD home, and I hadn't learned of it prior. How weird, you know? New York News didn't record it. Teaneck is, is right outside New York. It's 10 minutes outside New York City. Um, the New York News, the New Jersey News did not report it. I don't know. Okay, um, I have a ton more that I was prepared to show, and I, you know, I want to keep it at a more reasonable length. Um, and also, I have so many more artists to do that I didn't even grab albums by. Um, so this could be one of a series that hopefully doesn't depress people too much. But it's kind of weird. I got into jazz at a weird time, I guess. Uh, and you know, in the next, I guess probably 20 years. So I guess that's to be expected. Um, but a lot of the artists that, that I got into that were very much around when I started listening to, to, to jazz and active, still playing, um, that passed away, um, it's a bummer. You know, and the thing is, if you're not into any of these artists and any of this stuff sounds interesting, it's kind of great to your benefit that you can get into them only after they passed away. 
and uh, not get bummed when you hear that they passed away. So, okay, I'll keep this at 40 minutes. And, uh, you know, I was smart this time. I put my uh, phone yeah, out in the other room, the and there's people calling me anyway. Okay, guys, I'll be back hey, soon. Talk to you.